On October 24, 2025, a Cirrus SR22 Turbo, tail number 740 Tango Sierra, crashed approximately 9.15 p.m. local time, just north of the Lincoln, Montana airport. The pilot and sole occupant on board sustained fatal injuries. The flight had departed Feltz Field in Spokane, Washington VFR at 8.15 p.m. The pilot requested traffic advisories from air traffic control, but radar contact was lost northeast of Missoula, Montana. Squawking 1200 and on his own, the pilot continued toward Lincoln, Montana. However, after realizing he was lined up on a road for landing, the pilot attempted a go-around maneuver in an apparent attempt to put the airplane in left traffic for runway four. Regrettably, he navigated into featureless terrain of nighttime in the mountains. For more on the sequence of events and the factors under investigation, Let's bring in Copa University Dean of Aviation Safety, Mark Waddell. Mark? Thanks, Chuck. The NTSB has coded this accident as a loss of control in flight during the landing phase while the pilot was attempting to land at a remote mountain airport on a dark, moonless night. The NTSB issued a preliminary report where it described the flight path of the aircraft beginning with the descent to land. In fact, the pilot almost landed on a road going through town. Eventually, the pilot found his way to the airport, coming in at an angle to the runway. The pilot lost control as he turned away from the runway lights and towards the pitch darkness and featureless terrain that surrounded the airport. Thankfully, no one else was injured in the accident, despite the aircraft crashing near a residence. The aircraft was still in a tight left spiral under full power as it crashed into a stand of aspen trees. What went wrong? Pre-flight planning, risk assessment, knowledge of the systems on the aircraft, and training to use the safety systems on board the aircraft are all factors. South Ground Sierra 740 Tango Sierra, it's a fuel ready to taxi, uh, like a flight following to Sierra 69, and I do have Tango. Risk assessment. Two-thirds of general aviation accidents that occur in reduced visibility weather conditions are fatal. This is particularly so in remote areas with limited ground lighting, just like in this accident. These conditions can be disorienting, and can render rising terrain visually imperceptible. These typically lead to pilot spatial disorientation or controlled flight into terrain. Night IMC Mountains, pick one. The destination was a remote mountain airport surrounded by high terrain. And uh, radar contact is lost. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to take you back up, and uh, Taylor Center, or Salt Lake Center is not going to be able to see you as well. So radar service is terminated. You can squat the FR and put change of proof today. The NTSB recommends that instrument-rated pilots consider following instrument procedures when landing at such airports. And if not instrument-rated, don't attempt it. The risks are simply too great. In fact, Lincoln Airport has no current instrument procedure. However, it's been surveyed for a new procedure that's coming out next year. Significantly, the new procedure will not be available for use at night. The approach has high feeder routes that lead to a final segment aligned with runway 22. It also will have very high circling minimums, more than 1,700 feet above the airport. This is because pilots are going to have to provide their own terrain and obstruction clearance before they can descend for landing. The design's complicated by all the surrounding terrain and the obstacles. This chart shows the location of some trees that impact the circling areas. And again, for instrument rated pilots, this procedure won't be available at night. And for those who don't have an instrument rating, it should be a no-go. In addition, the NTSB recommends pilots seek training to ensure they are proficient and that they fully understand the limitations 
and the capabilities of all the equipment on their aircraft, particularly avionics and autopilot systems. This aircraft was equipped with synthetic vision, which can be an aid for maintaining situational awareness. However, it is not authorized for navigation. We also learned from the NTSB that the accident pilot had never landed at this airport, had no recent night flying experience. Again, he was not instrument rated, so how had he planned to accomplish this high-risk visual approach and landing at night? We can see the pilot threading his way through mountains during the descent. In the darkness, the pilot may have planned to let base to runway 4, but then he turned to line up on the road. After flying down the road, he then climbed and headed towards the middle of the airport. He wasn't aligned with the runway. The pilot turns away towards the darkness and loses control. Turning the nose drops, he almost hits the ground, setting off the TAWS warning. The system is covered in a supplement. Straight ahead climbs are emphasized. The emergency response to a pull up, pull up, toss warning should be covered during recurrent training. Pilots are trained to fly specific pitch and airspeed targets, but in this accident, the aircraft slowed below these recommendations. It entered a steep climbing left turn while bleeding off airspeed. The stall warning activated and an autopilot disconnect was recorded, which deactivated the autopilot as well as the yaw damper. With the engine racing at full power, the aircraft stalled again and then entered a tight left spiral into the ground. The digital autopilot on this aircraft is designed not to stall. I'll highlight just some of the features of the autopilot in this short video, but if pilots want to learn more, they should train with the CSIP or come to one of our CPPPs. Under speed protection would not have allowed the aircraft to slow to 50 knots and stall with the autopilot on. The system has two modes. The first is designed for situations where the pilot forgot to put in full power, which is not the case here. The other mode would not let the aircraft slow below 76 knots, and it does not seem likely that this autopilot could have stalled the aircraft in a full power climb. The aircraft is also equipped with an electronic stability and protection system. The system is designed to provide control force feedback to maintain aircraft control and engages automatically in the background using one or more of the servos when the aircraft gets near a defined operating limit. It's only active when the autopilot is off. Importantly, the pilot can interrupt the ESP by pressing and holding the autopilot disconnect button. For example, if the pilot pitches up too steeply, the ESP will activate at 17 and a half degrees nose up and begin pitching down. In addition, if the pilot is about to stall the aircraft, the ESP will activate to apply a downward pitch force. However, there's no notification to the pilot that it's engaging. Once activated, the maximum pitch force is reached over one and a half seconds. Once the warning is deactivated, then the pitch force is reduced over about two seconds. Get training regularly with Cirrus standardized instructor pilots to review these systems. When pilots add a lot of power, the nose will rise and the plane will roll unless controlled, but it will not stall on its own. The NTSB did not note any system failures, and it appears that the AP disconnect after the stall warning might have been caused by the pilot after ESP activation. Moreover, had the pilot activated caps when he lost control, he might have been home with his family that night. We know that pilots are more likely to use caps when they've had recent recurrent caps training. Please be honest with yourself about your skill limitations. Seek regular recurrent training to maintain proficiency and learn about the systems on the aircraft. And last, don't allow a situation to become dangerous before deciding to act.
We also wish to express deepest condolences to all family and friends of the deceased pilot. Naturally, they're probably searching for answers as to what caused this accident. None of us knows for sure. The NTSB should release upon a final report in about a year and a half. We wish all pilots, please keep up with your training and fly safely. Back to you, Chuck. Thanks, Mark. The NTSB, in its preliminary report, has coded this accident as a loss of control in flight during the landing phase. We can confirm the 66-year-old private pilot was not instrument rated, was not night current, and had never been to this airport. The aircraft involved, a Cirrus SR-22 Turbo, was a Generation 6 model equipped with advanced Garmin Perspective Avionics. This sophisticated avionics suite includes the GFC 700 Digital Autopilot, featuring electronic stability protection designed, in part, to assist the pilot by reducing the angle of attack should the pilot inadvertently near the critical angle of attack. As is standard with all Cirrus aircraft, this airplane was outfitted with CAPS, the Cirrus Airframe Parachute System the ultimate last line of defense. It has been debated whether an instrument rating would have helped this pilot. Subject matter experts agree an instrument rating would have helped simply because an instrument rated pilot would try to fly an instrument approach procedure in such dark conditions with terrain surrounding the airport. An instrument rated pilot would have realized there is no instrument approach to this airport which could have influenced any plan to arrive at night. Mark was able to find out that the FAA is designing an instrument approach to circling minimums only for this airport's runway 22. Of note, the FAA will designate that this approach will not be authorized at night due to high minimums requiring the pilot to provide their own terrain avoidance once beneath clouds. Still, this pilot did not fly his airplane into terrain, but rather lost control. From NTSB data, we know the pilot received a terrain awareness warning while maneuvering. He added full power to gain altitude, and in doing so, the airplane pitched up and rolled left, causing a stall warning and airspeed to slow enough to trigger discrete low speed mode. At this point, we believe it's likely the pilot disconnected the autopilot to relieve the forward pressure on the stick from the ESP engagement. His subsequent back pressure resulted in a second stall warning and full aerodynamic stall. Understanding how the electronic stability feature works are super important and must be a part of transition and recurrent training. It was a very dark, cold, and moonless night in the mountains on October 24th, 2025, the sort of conditions that call for extensive pre-flight risk mitigation planning, which, most importantly for this flight, must include pilot limitations. At the COPA Pilot Proficiency Program, our mantra is simple. Regardless of pilot proficiency, we say, night, mountains, IMC, pick one. We believe they're words to live by. If you're interested in joining the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association or learning more about free Cirrus Embark training, Cirrus Direct training, or the CPPP, we have put links in the description. I look forward to seeing you on the forums or better yet, at the next CPPP. I'm Chuck Cowley, and this has been First Takes.